when Siegfried Horn was in the committee that discussed my first commentary on Daniel, requested by the church, so I always gave the church the benefit of the doubt whenever there was a doubt. But in the footnotes and the appendices, I was more precise. For example, there was an appendix there that applied the Day of Atonement to the cross. But it took five years for that commentary to be accepted. Put the book editor in hospital with an ulcer or something similar. And one day Siegfried Horn, who was a very calm man, one day he lost his cool. He said, this is ridiculous. You're arguing over the fact that Ford sees Antiochus Epiphanes and his work in the second century BC as a type of what Antichrist would do later. He said, we've tried to interpret some of the women in Daniel 11 and given them specific titles. But all scholars around the world see Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel 8. Now later when Horn was asked to edit the Bible dictionary, which I have here, this is what he put. By the way, when Horn spoke up, then the opposition melted away and they published my book. And I've written about another four books on Daniel ever since, and one of them's called Daniel and the Coming King, and that deals with some of the controversy. Here's a statement from Horn's book, The Dictionary, Adventist Dictionary. Probably the book you should first read is a little book called In the Heart of Daniel. Some things that Cottrell wrote prompted me to get onto that in greater detail. And that's just a tiny book, very inexpensive. Maybe that's where you should start. In the Heart of Daniel with Daniel and the Coming King. Now here's from the SDA Bible Dictionary in the article on Daniel 8 about the little horn. The little horn of Daniel 8 takes away the daily sacrifice, cast down the place of his sanctuary. In chapter 7, the coming of the Ancient of Days in Judgment deprives the little horn of its power and awards the kingdom to the saints of the Most High. In chapter 8, at the close of the specified period of time, the sanctuary is, quote, cleansed, close quote, of the transgression of desolation erected in by the little horn. The same power destroys Jerusalem and the temple, causing the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and so on. Jews of the first century and the first century AD, 1st BC, 1st AD, applied the prophecy of the little horn to Antiochus Epiphanes. All traditional Adventism, including the book Great Controversy, which transcribes from some things Uriah Smith and Jane Andrews had written on the investigative judgment, all the Adventist statements, until the Dallas statement, insisted the investigative judgment was an investigation of the professed saints, not the little horn. Siegfried Horn says otherwise. And in the consensus statement, it says otherwise. The consensus statement does not say the investigative judgment is for the professed people of God. It says it is of the Antichrist power, the little horn power. No wonder the church has buried the consensus statement. It's like what happens at Palmdale. Robert Frame and I and Robert Parr and Dr. Salem met with Dr. Pearson and uh, Mr. Pearson, Robert Pearson, and the other people of GC, and we concluded that the New Testament teaches that righteousness by faith means justification. Its fruit is always sanctification. But the actual Greek word means to declare righteous. That's what happens when you accept Jesus. So the church turned from what it had taught for 150 years, when myself and some others stress what the New Testament taught in the Greek language. But as soon as Palmdar was over, Brother Pearson, who was a very good man, but no education, 
Mother Saint, he had the church turn its back on Palmdale, and we've gone back to the old teaching that justification by faith, righteousness by faith, is justification plus sanctification, which means you can never feel secure. Whereas the biblical teaching is, the moment you accept Jesus, you are declared righteous. And despite your infirmities and failures, you're still accepted as complete in him, accepted in the beloved. You have the verdict of the last judgment, the moment you believe in Jesus, provided you maintain that faith. Here's the little book I wrote on Daniel, the last one, very inexpensive. I think it would be of help to some. Let me say something more about Dallas. When the time came for setting up the Articles of Faith, the church sought the help of Andrews, the scholars at Andrews. But what the scholars did, the administrators did not recognise. The scholars departed from the traditional view. It was closer to Heppenstall's view, because Heppenstall had lots of problems with the investigative judgment, and he did not like at all the way traditionally we wrote believers of Christian assurance that we know we're right with God, despite our mistakes. So the scholars, when they wrote up for the Dallas Statement, the article on the sanctuary, it got rid of the traditional insecurity. It did not teach what great controversy taught on the investigative judgment. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I think highly of Ellen White. But I accept it when she says, as from fallibility, I have never claimed it. I've met a number of people that knew her. They all have the same picture of her. A lovely, homely woman with a sense of humour, intelligent and great interest in helping the poor. But we have used as the Bible, and that's false. She was against it. She held up the Bible at the last general conference she attended and implored the brethren to base everything on that and that alone. So Dallas came forth with a new approach to investigative judgment and then came forward and he scotched the lot. In other words, he said what the scholars had been thinking for over half a century and he didn't mind if he got sacked because he's very tired. He'd been working for months, seven days a week, preaching as well as teaching. So the Dallas statement was not traditional. The consensus statement was not traditional. The consensus statement says that within the veil means the second veil. The consensus statement says the judgment's on the wicked power, the little horn. The consensus statement says the New Testament always pictures Christ coming as imminent, and it has about another half a dozen statements that are in tune with I, what I had written. And so if you ask your pastor for a copy of the consensus statement, he probably can't dig it up unless it's a bit mouldy with age from 40 years ago. Well, let me just check if there's anything else I need to say to you. There's, how did the Dallas statement change? Phases of ministry and the little horn. <clears throat> the Dallas statement got rid of apartments until Dallas Adventism. Well, actually, some years earlier, they tried to get rid of apartments, but the coup d'etat took place in the Dallas statement and phases was substituted rather than apartments. New Testament knows nothing of a building in heaven with two apartments. It talks about the sanctuary on earth as a type of heaven itself, not a block of flats or a couple of rooms joined together. Heaven itself is the antitype of the sanctuary. And the Dallas statement, by focusing the judgment away from the saints and by using the word phase, departed from classical Adventism. So, in summary, what I've tried to say is nothing in my manuscript is really that new. 
and was not seen as new by most New Testament scholars and Old Testament scholars. An Adventist who worked at Bodley in the library, the most famous library in the world at Oxford, he said, don't let anyone tell you that Ford's manuscript is not scholarly. It is scholarly indeed. And that Dennis has appeared Porter. in French. Summer. Yeah, Dennis Porter. He'd worked in Bodley and for years. Des, you didn't mention about Gilbert Valentine's book. Oh, yes. Gilbert Valentine has written a recent book mainly discussing the prophetic heritage of Ellen White and how it has been handled by the General Conference. It's a very interesting little book, like everything Gilbert writes, particularly his biography of Prescott. He found out that Prescott rejected the investigative judgment. W. W. Prescott did not believe in the investigative judgment. Read Gilbert Ballantyne's book on Prescott. But in this more recent book about the prophetic heritage of Ellen White, he discusses how the brethren were troubled and could not answer men who knew theology better than they and who did not accept the investigative judgment. Such men as Conradi in Germany, who'd been responsible for huge accessions to the church. W. W. Fletcher in Australia, who'd worked in India and many parts of the world, and who was esteemed as a saint. Even people who disagreed with Fletcher loved him. And there were others like Ballinger. Ellen White may never have seen Ballinger's letter. W. C. White protected her when she got old from any letters that might trouble her. And she answered somewhat out of the dark when she criticised Ballinger. Ballinger wrote two great books, The Proclamation of Liberty and Power for Witnessing, and they are still esteemed by many non-Adventists. And I remember when I read The Proclamation of Liberty about 50 years ago, it was a blessing to me. So, read Gilbert Valentine for the struggles that GC had and its inadequacy of being able to answer the critics of the investigative judgment. That inadequacy has continued to the present day. It is a sad truth, but when denominations grow in size, their leaders often become businessmen rather than spiritual leaders. Anyone who has close acquaintance with the GC and is aware of what GC has tried to do last week to pass a resolution so everyone in the employ of the church must always agree to everything said by the General Conference. Happily, it was turned down, but the GC will try again. It is not true that Ellen White regarded GC as the voice of God on earth. When it was walking in harmony with the truth, she thought so. There were other times when she sharply criticised it, especially during her exile in Australia and when she returned and lived at Elmshaven in California. I recommend everything Gilbert Ballantyne has written. You will find blessing there. And so, my friends, really what I'm praying for is that the church may confess its errors, stop publishing stuff that's ridiculous, that nobody who knows the Bible can swallow. And when the church confesses, even the worldwide church of God under Herbert Armstrong, when he died, they confessed their errors, gave them up. Why can't Adventism do it? Adventism sacked 180 ministers and their families just after 1980 and the seven years that followed. 180 ministerial families without food, without support. The church has some apologies to make before God can bless it. So pray for the church. God bless you.